Welcome to the um, ninth, I think, annual uh, Green Space Gathering, which started nine years ago in the green room at Merrill Auditorium. And there was about a hundred people that came, actually. And we all sat in one big circle and talked about what we wanted to see happen in the parks in Portland. And um, then it just evolved, and with the help of the staff and and the great members of the Park Commission over the past few years, we've been able to continue doing this. Um, this particular night, we are um, looking to uh, give information. We have a stellar panel here. We actually have a couple of people running late in traffic from Augusta coming down and from Brunswick, but they reassured me they were gonna be here anytime now. So by the time we get to the panel, I think they will be here. <laughs> I hope they're here. Um, Anyway, I'm Dory Waxman, I'm the chair of the Park Commission, and uh, I'm going, what I'm going to do to start is I'm just going to uh, give a little tiny bit of history of why we came to this uh, topic of homelessness, our homeless neighbors and friends in our parks. Uh, it came up uh, probably about, well, maybe last fall, and people started seeing after Preble Street had closed at noon time their day services. We started seeing more people navigating into the parks for a place to go hang out and be, and um, and there was a there was a lot of confusion. So we just figured, as a park commission, because people were starting to call and say, "There's people here. We're not really sure what to do. Help. You know, what do we do?" And, and we're not the people to do the help, but we figured we could foster a community conversation that would bring some knowledge from our esteemed panelists who will be able, they have a wealth of experience, everyone on this panel, and they can uh, maybe answer, they're given six questions, and those questions I think will inform um, some of the concerns that are out there. The um, Green Space Gathering Subcommittee consists of Zach Hanker. I'm gonna have all the park commissioners come up anyway. So uh, we have Councillor Babson, Brian Babson here. Uh, he's our city council representative. Steve, District 3, this is his district. It is my district. This is five. This is three. This is three. This is three. Is it really? Okay. <laughs> Joe, help. <laughs> um, what do you say? We have Colette Bouchard um, from Bay, she is from Bayside. We have Mary Lowry, who is our, well, she was our land bank representative to the park commission, but now she's officially a park commissioner, right? Interview Almost. about to happen. About to happen. <laughs> Cynthia Lowenstein, Michael Murtaugh. Uh, Cynthia is the co she's the uh, sub she, well, she's the chair of the subcommittee on, um, on on initiatives in the parks. She's going to do a little bit of a presentation, tell you what the work is her committee has been doing. Michael Murtaugh has done a fabulous job with the fundraising arm that we've started in the park commission uh, with Love Portland, which is. <coughs> Um, an online catalog that he's going to explain to you. Amy Zach Nathan is our fearless writer who has done our annual report for not one year but two years with Colette and who else? Mary. And Mary. And Mary. I'm sorry. Um, so I just am lucky enough to be surrounded by good people and we're only as good as the people we're surrounded by. So I'm very blessed to be here, to be with this community and to be with and Marie, oh Marie, sorry, <laughs> Marie Gray, who is friends of Deering Oaks, friends of Deering Oaks, but also the former first lady of Portland, <laughs> wife of Joe Gray. <laughs> we we never really had a first lady, but you, you were that person. So, um, so um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to turn this over to Michael, maybe. Michael, you could speak about the project that you've been working on, and then Cynthia after that, and then Nathan. Okay. Well, we have Portland for many years has had a giving program that uh, invites citizens of Portland to contribute to parks, uh, but it's been a dormant program for many years. Uh, the parks, the parks department has has gotten it up and running. Uh, it's it's been back on its feet for for a while now. And we are, we are now uh, involved in the Parks Commission working very closely with, uh, with the department staff, and notably Ali, who's coming up here to help, uh, have been working on, 
I'm bringing it up to date and I'm providing more offerings, more options to, uh, to residents of Portland in the, the types of contributions they might make, the types of improvements they might support, broadly in two categories. So park, park improvements of various kinds for park furniture, park benches, uh, drinking fountains, uh, and so on, and, and for, for plantings in parks. Uh, with a number of tree options that uh, that individuals can can select from for uh, for planting in parks, some of the some of these options are are for designated parks with the uh, parks department identifying where 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 there are needs in some areas uh, we're reaching saturation. Okay. We're not. Okay. Okay. And, and uh, in others, they are they are general. They are generally uh, uh, given to the parks as a whole. And then the other category of improvements. Okay, so here, this is this is an illustration of the uh, some of the tree offerings for, for large for large large shade trees and smaller ornamental trees. And these were selected in consultation with uh, Jeff Tarling, our, our our arborist, as as being hardy and and, and well adapted to Portland's climate. These are, these are some of the trees. We, have, we are, are also, in addition to the the, uh, the amenities, there are uh, there is there there is uh, 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 there are several options for people to support recreational programs in the parks. Uh, we're starting with the, the Mitchell Tesco program, uh, uh, program which is which is an existing program that is has been added to this program, and then with a halfway program at the at the skating rink to support. Uh, to cover the cost for students or for young people who like to participate, but who come from families of limited means and can't afford to can't afford to do that. Uh, for each for each one of these, we have we have developed uh, a description of the of the offerings and the uh, and the uh, the cost of activities. We are starting. This is this is a considerable expansion from what the program was at the start of the exercise. But it's it's smaller than we anticipated will become. So we're, we're trying to start fairly modestly and get this up and running, get this underway, and uh, and expand it as as we learn from the experience and and um, as we have more confidence in uh, that, that it will work. There are opportunities for people to click on the options that they would like to support and provide their credit card information online to make uh, to make payments directly without unduly burdening uh, the department staff. It's been a, a concern throughout is that we would like to <coughs> minimize the disruption and the and the burden on city staff, although there there is an evidence <coughs> out that it's uh, hopefully will be not And we're going live That's right, going live the next park, park commission parks commission meeting in, in June. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right, now <coughs> the mayor. Hi, um, so there's been a committee um, that I'm chairman of uh, that's in charge of uh, citizen, um, sorry, um, parks initiatives. And this year we we're working on a uh, project called the Baxter Trail. I just want to recognize Colette who's on our um, committee and Ethan um, and uh, David Little who is not here right now. He's a, um, a member of uh, Friends of Evergreen. Pretty small group, mm -hmm. um, but what we've been working on is trying to um, uh, write up the history of the Baxters and talk about what incredible benefactors they were to the city of Portland and what an incredible legacy they left us. So if you get a chance, um, wander to the back table and you'll see a series of seven signs and um, we've created these signs to tell a little bit about what the Baxters have done, starting with the Baxter Boulevard, which you're all um, mm -hmm. Quite, um, familiar with, but what's interesting is the stories that go along with it. For instance, it took 23 years for, back, for that award to be created because there was lots and lots of issues, and there's some um, lots of information um, you'll see in the signs that talk about um, the, uh, different stories. Like, for instance, the linden trees along the um, ever, uh, along the boulevard; those are uh, in commemoration of some of the fallen soldiers in World War One. So we have about seven signs. It's the, the trail is 3.25 miles long, and you can take it from either direction. So it starts at um, the shopping center at Baxter Boulevard. It goes uh, terminates at Evergreen Cemetery. 
and I hope you can take a chance to go back there and look at it. I think that we're looking for installation this summer, is that right, Ethan? Um, we've had some wonderful um, um, design done by Jack uh, Gearlin and Nancy Montgomery, so you can take a look at them um, when you get a chance. And if you see anything and you want to bring it to our attention, any typos or anything like that, please do, because we're still in the editing phase. Is there anything else you want to add, Ethan? No, it just you know, tells a great story. We're trying to tell more stories in the parks. So. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. And um, Nathan, could you broaden the come and talk about the banana report? Um, thank you so much for coming. Uh, this is great. And um, Nathan Robbins, uh, I'm our chair of our annual report subcommittee, and I should recognize uh, Mary Lowry. Oh, okay. Yes, <laughs> um, yeah, it's okay. Uh, casual. Uh, where, you know, I think that kind of speaks to the parks in general. Um, but um, uh, so we have, uh, since our new park ordinance, uh, been uh, reporting annually uh, as a parks report that sort of summarizes the state of the parks um, and is a work collectively with the Parks Commission and with the Parks Department on uh, preparing that report. And it summarizes the state of the parks, but it also makes recommendations for improvements in the parks. And the primary audience for that is the City Council. Um, so we make a presentation to the Council um, for in that report and recommendations along to them. Um, and it's really an opportunity, I think, for us, um, not just uh, for that uh, sort of sub way I summarized it, but there's many other aspects that we try to fold into it around our capital improvement projects and um, through our green space gathering and through our uh, meetings where we hear from uh, all of the users of the parks and um, can really try to um, put that to let together in a collective voice. And so while the primary audience is the city council, we really hope that anybody who has interest in the parks, using the parks, or improving the parks will, will engage with it and engage with us. And um, we will do our best to try to reflect that into the report and, and um, use that as just another opportunity to uh, forward where we see um, sort of the state of the parks and, and how, how we can best improve them. Uh, and uh, so I think that's probably the Easiest way to start. I don't want to take too much time because we have such a great panel here and, uh, and many other good things to get to. Thank you, Nathan. Um, so, Crackle Pine arrived just now. You feel good from Israel. <laughs> um, he's also an esteemed member of this commission. Um, I just want to say that, that all of these folks here, they donate a lot of time an effort to be the guardians of the parks. There's lots of people of you out there that do your own in your own parks. But with the staff, which is extraordinary, Sally, Matt, Ethan, Ellen is like she does like runs around helping us all the time to do our work. But this group is um, we're just really lucky. You should all feel really fortunate that you have the caliber of people here who are caring and loving and really there for, for our parks, trails, and open spaces. It's really important. So would you clap for them? <laughs> so the next person that I'm going to introduce is a new member of staff in Portland. I don't, I'm not sure, Sally, when did he come? About eight months ago? Matt. How long have you been here? How long have you been here, Matt? Uh, started in August. Started in August. Matt Coleman comes from, did you come from Pennsylvania to here? Oh, no. New Jersey. New Jersey? Yeah. Oh, my goodness. But he comes with a wealth of, of recreational experience and knowledge, and he's just, he's jumped in and tried to, you know, really be a, a working part of the, Sally's got a wheel here with their, he's a cog in that. He's, he's a, he's, he's a spoke in the cog of the wheel, right? <laughs> Uh, so he and Jill, who's Jill? Jill, our ranger, Jill, coming on up. Um, Jill's our wonderful ranger. She's going to be here. They're going to just give you an overview of department projects that are going on. And uh, when they're done, we'll go on to the next step.
Hi, thank you. Um, yes, my name is Matt Coleman. I'm from New Jersey, uh, central New Jersey on the coast. Um, like Jill, I worked as a park ranger back in New Jersey for several years and then became the assistant superintendent of the Monroe County Park System and then uh, had the fortune to come up here and join the team uh, with Portland Parks Rec and Facilities. Uh, so I just wanted to talk a little bit about um, the, some of the projects that we're working on and then also about the Portland Opportunity Crew, which a lot of you are probably already familiar with. Um, but for those of you that are not, I'll just give you a little background. Um, but for me, I'm in the department, I'm the parks director, so I oversee the um, parks, open spaces, trails, uh, the park ranger program with Jill, uh, forestry, horticulture, athletic facilities, cemeteries, uh, playgrounds. Uh, so the parks division, we currently have a total of 33 funded projects that are both active and are upcoming here in the future. Uh, some of the projects that we're working on, we have two new playgrounds that are going to be installed, one at Riverton School and one at Doherty Field. Um, we also have some projects taking place in Deering Oaks, uh, a pond aeration system that we hope will help with the, um, the algae and some of the issues that we have with the water quality in the pond. We're actually looking to install that uh, beginning of next week, so that's going to be right around the corner to check out. Um, we're keeping our fingers crossed that this is going to make a positive improvement on the water quality. Uh, we also have a future picnic pavilion and zip line that will be installed near the playground area of Deering Oaks. And we're also looking at a um, plaza improvements across from the castle where the Tika Cafe is located. Some other things going on, we have a futsal court that will be installed at Fox Field. Um, we have the development of the uh, new master plan, well, yeah, brand new master plan for Western Promenade, so that's going to be very exciting. Um, we're looking for a lot of participation from uh, area folks that will, they, there's a survey online that you can have your voice heard to give us some, some pointers as to what you would like to see take place. Uh, and then we also have some shade structures that are going to be installed. We have one coming up at Will's Playground at Eastern Prom. And we also have one at the Qantas Playground and Pool Area. And then plus uh, various improvements to park infrastructure. All these projects taking place, um, it's a lot of action going on. On top of all that, we still have our day-to-day -day, uh, daily maintenance operation tasks that we're trying to accomplish. Uh, with the Portland Opportunity Crew, uh, we have some information back on our table. Please check it out. Uh, but the Portland Opportunity Crew, it's a pilot program offering panhandlers the opportunity to earn money to clean up public areas and linking them to needed services, uh, especially job training and support. City Social Services Division, they partner with the Parks Division to implement the program. Uh, it operates usually two to three days a week for approximately beginning April, May, and extending on until November. Uh, each day there is a crew of six people that are hired. Participants are provided tools, protective equipment, transportation, uh, some meals during the day, and are paid a minimum wage. Uh, the goals of the program, uh, there, there's several, um, one of which is panhandlers will earn more money in a safely and in a safe manner and have a healthy meal in exchange for payment and connections to services. Uh, the city's public spaces will become cleaner and safer, that's a big bonus for the program. Staff will build trusting relationships that will target populations to move them out of panhandling and onto safer, healthier, uh, self-sufficient career paths. And finally, panhandlers will be able to seek employment with the city and also local landscape agencies or pursue training in a different career path. So it, it takes donations, it takes money to fund this, this great program. Any amount of donation helps the, the program be a success um, but for $1,300, uh, if that donation is accepted, businesses can hire the, the, an entire crew for one week. Uh, this money will provide jobs and meals for workers, help clean up public spaces, and provide a pathway to future career and supportive services. Uh, the $1,300 sponsorship, it also includes advertising uh, at cleanup sites while, while the workers are active, cleaning up in, in the parks. Um, publicity from the city on our website and social media, and it's also tax deductible.
uh, some information as far as how you can contribute to hire the crew and sponsor the crew or to make uh, a donation. Please visit the city website at portlandmaine.gov forward uh, slash crew or you can text uh, crew, C-R-E-W, to 91999. Uh, so there's some information about the program. Uh, we'll be back at the table if you have any other questions. And I'd like to introduce uh, Jill Mulkern. She's our supervising park ranger. Uh, she'll talk to you a little bit about the park ranger program, um, what they do. Um, she's our lone park ranger year round, so she has, um, she has a lot of uh, ground to cover and a lot of tasks to accomplish. She has a seasonal crew in the summertime, um, but they do a fantastic job. They're the face of the department in the parks. Um, they're the ones that are having those face-to-face -face interactions on a daily basis. So here's Jill. Thank you, Matt. Uh, I'm Jill, like Matt said. I've been here um, full-time for three years now. Over 10 years, I've done this job on and off. Um, and I can't get away from it, so I'm here now full-time. Um, I have a passion for what I do. I really care about our parks, the people that use it, no matter who they are or what demographic they fall in. Um, a little overview of what we do. We patrol over the 1,200 acres of open spaces, trails, playgrounds. Um, the rangers are there. We have a very small crew and I'm the only one in the winter time, so it's about eight months of just me and I can't cover everything every day. Um, we, so when I do have a crew, we train with the Portland PD. We have um, at least one to two days with them and we go over verbal judo, situational awareness, um, we'll do ordinances, overview, ticket writing because all of us are deputized constables and all of them wear a uniform like I'm wearing right now. Um, we also go to, we just started going to the shelter. Um, because I want the rangers to understand where a lot of our patrons that come and visit our parks, that might sleep in our parks, where they might be avoiding. Um, and they get to kind of see why someone might, want, might not want to go to the shelter. And it's really important to see them as a human and not a problem. And that is my main concern is that if someone goes in and just looks at them as a problem, you're taking the human away, which we do not want. Um, we enforce all park-related ordinances, so um, dogs are a big issue. Uh, smoking, drinking, camping, um, and littering, those are just a few things that we do enforce, and we do it daily, and we make sure that the parks are safe, clean, and a happy place for everybody to enjoy, no matter who you are. Um, we do wellness checks. If someone is sleeping in the direct sun wearing a sweatsuit, we might um, wake them up to ask them if they're okay because it's, if it's a hot day, we want to make sure that that person is all right. Uh, we do not kick anyone out of the parks if they're using the parks appropriately. Um, if we do see smoking or drinking or camping, um, we will have a discussion with that person and sometimes they will move along or they simply pour out their alcohol, put out whatever they're smoking, or they will take down their campsite. Um, so when it comes to camping, the park rangers will uh, patrol. If, we're to get, if we have pairs, we try to do that because we try not to go into an enclosed area by ourselves because um, safety is in numbers. So we will ask if anyone's home. If anyone's home, we'll have a discussion with the person. We will let them know about our ordinance um, that says that camping is not allowed in Portland. No matter who you are or where you come from, uh, you're not allowed to camp here. Um, we ask them if they need a trash bag to clean up any litter that might be around their campsite. And then we also ask them if they need any bags for their belongings to help uh, take down their campsite. Um, if they are not there, we give them a camping car, and it describes what our ordinance is, what chapter it is, and then on the, the park hours and on the back side, it kind of does an overview of the ordinance. On the bottom, it gives, um, it says for immediate assistance, you can go to the Oxford Street Shelter. It has the address, the number, and we date and time it because they have 48 hours to vacate wherever they are camping. Um, if they do not remove their belongings, the rangers will go in and we will remove the belongings and dispose of them appropriately. Um, 
So that is a little bit of an overview of what we do. Um, homelessness is just a very small part, and like I said, it doesn't matter who is doing a wrong behavior, whoever is doing something inappropriate, the rangers will go and have a discussion with them. We do not single out any person or demographic whatsoever. I don't know who's talking next. to introduce who is new. We have a new Portland Park Conservancy and they've just hired their executive director, first executive director, Nan Cumming. Could you just put your hand up, Nan? So now we're going to go to Sally DeLuca, the queen of Parks and Rec. Like Pat Elman used to be the queen of the tourism department in Augusta. Sally's the queen of Parks and Rec. She's dedicated her entire life to raising a beautiful daughter and also to the Parks and Recreation Department in Portland. We are incredibly indebted to her for her incredible work over 35 years. Okay. Anyway, so she's going to come, and Sally's going to come up and, and, and talk about what goes on in other places besides Portland. We do have to get outside of our own box sometimes. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you all for coming tonight. I'm going to talk about homelessness in general, and especially from a parks and recreation perspective. So bear with me. Aaron Geyer, who um, works in social services, he was going to join me today, but he got called to um, go to the finance committee and talk about his budget. So. I think he'd rather be here with us, but <laughs> he has to go before the finance committee. This is, this is not going to be new information for many of you. Local parks departments are on the front line of dealing with the daily realities of homelessness. Park agencies are striving to balance the needs of park users and the homeless and to show compassion for individuals while enforcing park rules and maintenance standards. As you have seen recently in the media, our own city is struggling to select a site for a new homeless service center here in Portland. We all know we need one, but no one wants it in their backyard. The issue of homelessness is affecting more and more parks and rec agencies. The presence of homeless in our park system has necessitated the development of new strategies to address the many problems associated with homelessness while providing for public safety and protecting our community resources one of the big challenges. I want to take a few minutes to frame the issue a little bit. Health and Human Services defines a homeless person as an individual without permanent housing who may live on the streets, stays in a shelter or mission, stays in a single room occupancy facility, stays in an abandoned building or vehicle, or any other unstable or non-permanent place. Research finds that approximately 30% of homeless individuals are unsheltered, living on the street, a park, or an abandoned building. I thought this was an interesting statistic as I was researching this. According to HUD, before the recession of 2008, an estimated 2.5 to 3 million men, women, and children were experiencing homelessness each year in this country. After the housing bubble burst, they estimated that over 7 million people lost their homes and either moved in with family and friends or became homeless themselves. According to the National Law Center on Homelessness, the five major reasons people are homeless are lack of affordable housing, unemployment, poverty, mental illness and lack of needed services, and substance abuse and the lack of needed services. In 2017, the homelessness rate per 100,000 people by state, the highest was the District of Columbia. They have 983 homeless people. New York has 470. This is per 100,000 people. So in the District of Columbia, they have 6,800 homeless individuals. In New York, they have over 91,000. 
Hawaii has over 6,400. Oregon has over 13,000. California has almost 130,000 homeless people. I was struck by the fact that Maine, on this list, Maine was number 12, with um, over 2,400 homeless people here in the state. And our Health and Human Services Department told me that um, on an average night, uh, 525 folks are homeless here in Portland. Sometimes it helps to know we are not alone. In January of this year, the National Parks and Recreation Association did a featured article on the increase in homelessness in our parks and open spaces. After their research was done, they concluded that the symptomatic impacts of homelessness, such as trash, campsites, and the ongoing presence of people experiencing homelessness, often upset other park users and drove many of them to voice public complaints to park management, police, and health departments. Complaints to Parks Department included requests to remove trees, restrooms, vegetation, pavilion walls, and benches used by people experiencing homelessness. Constant public pressure regarding homelessness was reported to be stressful and costly to local park departments and often felt beyond the scope of their professional duties and training. Community pressure to respond quickly encouraged the use of short-term, immediate responses by local park departments. Maintenance crews were often pulled off their regular duties um, and tasked with posting eviction notices, like the ones Jill just showed us, throwing away camp belongings, and removing healthy vegetation and park infrastructure to try to discourage folks and the public complaints. Predictably, as, as NRPA told us, these short-term symptomatic fixes did not encourage lasting changes. Most park workers reported that all they did was chase the encampment from park to park. That's also been our experience here, too. Results of this survey are on our Parks and Rec website, as well as the Park Commission's website. It's really a great report if you get a chance to look at it. The Parks table has a card that shows you the website. It was. How many pages long was it, Allie? Ten. Ten. So it was, it was going to be a lot of paper, so we decided just to steer you towards the website. Most park managers reported that public education is an important step in generating community support to address homelessness in the parks. Tonight is a first step for us to discuss this important topic. They recommended a list of talking points as part of a public education strategy, and here are a few of those talking points. All members of the community are welcome to use parks and open spaces. Anyone can experience homelessness. Know the rules of the park. Call the parks or police department when necessary. Become familiar with the organizations that serve those experiencing homelessness. We have, com we have printed the complete list of the educational model that they have, and um, that is in the back table at the Parks Commission's table. We also have a community services resource guide that Allie created for us, and that's also back at the Parks Commission table. And that gives you um, access to all of the folks in the community who work with and try to help folks who are homeless. We certainly have a lot of work to do on this subject. We appreciate all the work that all of you do in the parks, and thank you for um, participating tonight in this really important discussion. Uh, one more guest before we're going to get to the panel, and that is our esteemed chief, uh, acting chief of police, Vern Malik, who's going to come up and talk to us about what it's like to be on the front line. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thanks, everybody. I, uh, I just, I'll be very brief, but uh, I just wanted to, to let you all know that we do work very closely with, with the park rangers and with Sally and all of her staff. Um, Parks are a tough thing to police uh, because they're remote, they're so large, um, and in many instances, they're 
they're sort of secluded because you want some privacy, you want to feel like you're not in the city anymore, um, which makes it tough for us to police it. So we do rely heavily on the interaction we have with the rangers um, to let us know where the problem areas are and where the places are that, that need extra police attention. And that also goes for uh, for other groups, you know, the, the Friends of Deering Oaks, the Friends of Western Prom, uh, you know, having a relationship with, with all these organizations help direct us on where the problems really are. And what we know for sure is that we can chase them. We can move them around, um, but sometimes it feels like that's all we're doing. So I'm, I'm really glad that there's a panel here to talk about the homeless uh, issues and homeless mm -hmm. concerns. I will make a, a, a you know, reiterate a point that's already been made though, and that is that um, our officers, just like the Rangers, we address behavior. We don't care whether you're homeless or not. Um, and the example that I, I give you is that if you're two law school students and you're sitting in Deering Oaks on a nice plaid blanket with a picnic basket drinking a bottle of wine, you're committing the same violation as the two homeless people who are sitting on a sleeping bag drinking a Natty Daddy. And our approach to that violation is the same. We will warn both of you that you're committing a crime and we'll ask you to put your liquor away and not do it again. If you've been warned for it, you could receive a ticket or even be arrested. So it's the behavior that we're, that we're interested in and that we want to address. Um, and you know, Jill did a great job of talking about the behaviors that are problematic. It's the drug use, which we see the signs of with, with discarded syringes. Um, you know, it's the drinking in public and, uh, you know, it's public urination, things like that. And it certainly is worse in certain parts than others, um, but we see it in all. I mean, the same thing's happening in Evergreen Cemetery uh, down on the back side. Jill's nodding her head yes. Um, it, it also happens in the Western Prom, the Eastern Prom, Harvard Park, Daring Oaks. Um, so that's to my point that we know we can move it around and sort of chase it. But uh, hopefully, this esteemed group is going to give us some great uh, solutions on how to solve it. And uh, that's all I have. Uh, I'm pleased to be here. I'm going to stay um, just because I sort of want to hear what the issues are even more. And uh, I'll be here for a little while afterwards. If you all, who I think, I suspect, have first hand knowledge about what the specific issues are, if you want to talk with me about those, I'll be sticking around. Thank you. Thank you for being here, though. Um, so now I'm going to just bring up Zach and he's going to be introducing the panel, and we're going to get started. Yeah, so my name is Zach Anchors, and I'm on the Parks Commission. I'm also on the board of the Franklin Eastern Promenade. And I'm up here just to, to introduce the panel, so I'll get right into that. Um, and after the discussion, there will be uh, time for questions from the audience. And uh, we're going to just pass around some. Uh, we're going to pass around some note cards that you can write questions on, and then we'll just me and Amy will come around and collect them, so we can ask your questions if you have any. Um, so I'm just going to go from left to right, introducing everybody here. Uh, we've got we tried to bring together a range of perspectives on this issue from social service agencies and law enforcement, uh, people who are experiencing homelessness. Um, and I think we've got that with this great group of people who bring lots of knowledge and insight. Um, so on the left, we have uh, first Dana Tottman. Uh, from, he's the president of Avesta Housing, which is one of the main providers of affordable housing in the region. Um, and then we have uh, Sarah For uh, Forehens, did I pronounce that correctly? Um, director, director of the Oxford, Oxford Street Shelter, which is run by the city of Portland. We have uh, Mike Sosachuk, who's the, commission, the main commissioner of public safety, and he's also the, the former assistant city manager uh, in Portland. Um, we have uh, Leslie Clark, uh, who's executive director of the Portland Recovery Community Center, um, which is a, a, a safe haven for people in addiction recovery. Uh, we have Jim Devine, who was a representative from Homeless, Homeless Voices for Justice, which is a grassroots advocacy group um, uh, that's based out of Crowell Street. And our moderator is uh, Diane Davison, 
who is a former chair of the Parks Commission uh, and also a former executive director of the Friends of the Eastern Promenade. So with that, I'll hand it over to, to Diane. So good evening, everyone. Um, it's a pleasure, it's an honor to be asked to do this tonight, and uh, it's a pleasure to be here, and it's so nice to see everyone's face again. It's, uh, everyone that's in this room cares about parks, and it's the reason that people want to live in Portland because of our cherished open spaces. So we all share that, and uh, as Dory and everyone else has alluded to, kudos to everyone, and my gratitude for uh, the labors of love, the volunteerism, the city staff that work so hard, and uh, everyone who just does what they can to uh, keep our parks special. So um, with that, I would like to ask our panelists, and we'll, again, we can just start, well, maybe we'll start at the other end, and um, go ahead and start with you, Jim, with just giving a brief introduction about yourself and speaking to question one, which um, I'm realizing members of the public don't have the questions. So I'm going to let folks know what question one is, and then as you introduce yourself, you can um, speak to question one, which is, um, when someone in Portland is using a park in a way that conflicts with other users, uh, such as you know using drugs, camping, threatening behavior, panhandling, etc., what happens? And what do police, social service agencies, and parks groups do to handle these situations? And what's the role of the organization that you represent in dealing with these situations? Yeah, well, it's an easy first question. I, I tell you what, it's an easy first question, but I got a lot to talk about, and I don't have like two hours to say what I have to say, but I, do, I, I will pertain to the question. I mean, I'm an advocate with quote unquote Pearl Street Homeless Voice for Justice because I've experienced homelessness. That's one of the qualifications. And most of my life, I was a master electrician and contractor, but my struggle with alcohol caused me to experience homelessness. And I'm grateful with the help of providers and Alcoholics Anonymous, particularly having had a drink for a long time, you know, and so I'm grateful for that. Give me a chance to do other more interesting things. But, you know, I've been involved with a lot of different things. I was on the panhandling committee that Portland Downtown set up to, to address the issue of panhandling. I've done several presentations to businesses about their interaction with the homeless community. And I'm quite familiar. I've been on a couple of excursions with the quote unquote home team that circles through the the parks and we've gone to St. John Street and Lincoln Park and various parks to talk to people and, and get them the help they need. And so there's always a uh, there's always a provider available, not always, but there are providers available, hopefully, that'll help people without necessarily locking up in jail. And I really helped I really had a good time uh, working with uh, then Police Chief Mark Suscheck about the quote unquote criminal trespass ordinances. It was a, a particularly interesting thing to my former friend, Steve Houston, who was unfortunately no longer with us, because he was he had quit drinking, and he couldn't be in parks because of his drinking behavior, but he was, wasn't drinking no more, so he wanted to be able to go back and sell his paintings, and having the things reduced and the appeals process put in place was very beneficial to him, and I appreciate that. And I kind of lost track of what I'm trying to say, but, you know, I mean, in all our, interaction with the business community and, and, and other members of the public. We, we try to emphasize the fact that you know, homeless people are people and they they need help sometimes, they need services. I mean, I don't know if anybody's ever been to the Ark Street Shelter, I'm not to complain about the shelter necessarily, but the reality is that the Ark Street Shelter is this huge room with a whole bunch of, with 200 mats on the floor, a foot from each other, and everybody sleeps on a mat next to people they don't even know. And there are other people, there are people, because of issues or claustrophobia or whatever, who prefer to camp outside rather than sleep in that environment. And, and now, with the city planning to relocate the shelter with a possibility of putting well in Riverside Park, it's going to make it harder to access services overall. So I think I'm done for now. <laughs> Does that make any sense? Um, hi, I'm Leslie Clark, stand up too. Um, and I'm uh, the executive director at the Portland Recovery Community Center. And I'll just tell you really briefly what we do. And then that first question is actually a little bit of a tough one um, to think about for me. So um, the Portland Recovery Community Center started in 2012 
Um, we do four things. So one is we provide a safe haven for people seeking or in recovery from addiction or what we now call substance use disorder, alcohol use disorder. And um, we do that with all kinds of support groups. It's very grassroots, um, mostly volunteer driven. Um, and other kinds of social activities, uh, recovery coaching, telephone recovery support, all kinds of things. We have, we have about 125 people a day come through the PRCC, as we call it. The second thing we do is really work with um, doing all kinds of education um, and also support for family members and friends. Um, resources for housing, helping people find housing jobs, um, health care. And the third thing we do is advocacy to help um, promote and encourage resources for people who are in need of and recovering from addiction. And lastly, we now service the main recovery hub to open eight, soon nine, new centers throughout, recovery community organizations throughout the state of Maine so that people will have access to recovery supports in their communities. Um, you know, I was thinking our, our role is um, a little bit outside of the direct part of this question, right? Because we see people when they are seeking, wanting recovery from addiction. So where addiction ties in to this question is kind of where we tend to meet people. About 25% of the people who come to the PRCC are experiencing homelessness. And um, there's an old saying in recovery about recovery is not for people who need it, it's for people who want it. And so then the question becomes, what is the mechanism or what, is, what are the conditions that we can impact that help move people from a place of suffering from this really tough disease to wanting and believing that their potential and their life purpose can be something much greater. Nobody ever started out in life that I can think of thinking I want to grow up and be homeless and addicted to drugs and alcohol. That's not what anybody wants for their child. It's not what anybody wants for themselves. So once you're in that place of finding yourself staying in a park um, and in all those conditions, what is, I guess I'm asking it more as a question, that becomes the question, how do we help people move from what um, they need into what they believe they can have? All right, well thank you, uh, Mike Soschuk. Uh, so I spent a little time in, in Portland over the last couple of decades. Um, I will tell you that uh, when I left the city to go work for the state of Maine, I, I left as an assistant city manager. And uh, one of the city departments that I had the honor to work with was, was parks and, and recreation facilities. And uh, I can tell you that some of the best days I had was driving around with Ethan and Matt and Ethan and Sally and going around and visiting sites and seeing things uh, through their eyes. And uh, we really are lucky uh, to have the Parks Commission and our parks team doing the work that they do uh, every day. So they're, they're pretty special folks, very passionate about what they do. Uh, so that's that's good stuff all the way around. I will tell you, uh, for for me tonight, uh, I'm here to kind of talk about our new role as as the commissioner, I suppose, a state view on these issues. Uh, my Portland police chief is in the room, Bern Malik, and uh, he's the subject matter expert. And so if there's any crime related stuff or problem solving issues, I'll turn to Bern. Truth be told, uh, just like I have for the last 10 years, uh, and I was in a command staff position, I worked hand in hand with Bern every day. Was in the right hand, he was both hands, and. Uh, a special guy all around. So I won't dive in on any of those Portland style issues, but I can tell you the Department of Public Safety deals with various aspects of this problem statewide. Uh, and I think one thing that we're keying on as a profession in public safety is not just dealing with the issue uh, real time. I, I know we will continue to have arrests at 2 a.m. on the sidewalk, but I want to know how they got there. And I want to look as far upstream as humanly possible to see how we can help solve those issues before they start. And in, in my role with the state, what we can do is focus on the Maine Criminal Justice Academy and how we train our officers. Uh, Jim, Homeless Voices for Justice, 
uh, the entire team uh, teaches our cops, our baby cops, shiny pennies in the police academy, uh, how to work with people and how to talk about their experiences. Uh, and uh, you can't beat that opportunity. Uh, Jim had touched on the criminal trespass paperwork time frame. Uh, when we had that conversation, I had been in Portland a number of years, and I learned a lot. I learned a lot by sitting at the table, uh, which is why I consider Jim to be a friend of this day. Steve Houston, uh, Tom, the whole crew uh, was very, very incredibly knowledgeable because they lived it, they could feel it. Uh, and if you open your mind, you can feel it through them uh, to the best of your ability. I will tell you this morning, um, the state of Maine had its first children's cabinet, the first uh, cabinet meeting in the last 10 years or so. And one of the goals of that particular cabinet was talking about youth homelessness, youth risk, you know, youth that happen to be at risk. And that homelessness aspect, I think, is something that, uh, that I can bring to the table. Uh, there aren't a lot of communities uh, in the state that deal with homelessness issues to the level that, that we have uh, in the city of Portland for a number of years. So we can bring that conversation to the table. Having conversation with the, the Maine State Housing Authority, uh, which I did early on, sitting in budget meetings, uh, we're having these same kind of conversations. Because when I talk to cops in Lewiston, as an example, they have a Kennedy Park. They're a little different than our Kennedy Park, but they have a Kennedy Park and they deal with problems by community policing and outreach and collaboration and partnerships, which is exactly what uh, the world that I'm used to working in uh, so while their problems may not be, or their levels, or their numbers, or whatever those may be, may not be uh, at some of the levels that we've dealt with year to year, uh, it's all relative. You know, and I'll talk to a police chief in Gardner, and they say, so what's going on? He said, well, it's the same thing was going on in Portland. It's just I've got 10 guys, and you had 160. Uh, and our population is this, so it's all relative to that. And I think that's important for the entire state of Maine to remember. Uh, that these problems are everywhere, and they're everybody's problems. There's everybody's issues. There's everybody's residents and citizens that we need to help uh, and to make them better. So I appreciate the opportunity to be here, and uh, thank you. Um, Sarah Clarence, I'm the shelter director for the city of Portland Oxford Street Shelter. So our role is that we are a 24-hour low-barrier emergency shelter provider for people experiencing homelessness in the city of Portland. And so I want to thank the Parks Commission and the Parks Department first for putting this on, um, but also for their interest in putting together a community resource guide. So I think that's really important as far as education goes. I think that's important because we have fantastic community partners in the city of Portland who are out there outreaching people in the parks, um, and not just in the parks, but just in general in the city of Portland. And so I think it's um, very important that people are able to access those resources know who those individuals are. The PATH team in the city of Portland, the home team, as Jim mentioned, in the city of Portland. Amistad has people out there outreaching people in the parks. So I think those are all fantastic resources that are available and um, making sure are well known. Uh, good evening, I'm Dana Todman. Um, I'm with the Vesta Housing. And, and at the Vesta Housing, we have about 2,700 um, Apartments that we provide to people um, throughout uh, Maine and New Hampshire. About 750 or 800 of those are located right here in Portland. So clearly, when we're talking about homelessness, um, we probably more than, than, than most can solve that problem because when we get somebody a home, they're no longer homeless. That's fundamentally what we do. Uh, but uh, last year, we had 4,100 different uh, households apply to us for housing, and we were able to move in 307. And so, to, to give you an idea of just how daunting the affordable housing challenge is, um, please keep that particular number in mind. We're helping about one out of 11, um, and the rest of our side is saying doubled up, if it's a senior household, they may be living in an unsafe place, and many are, in fact, homeless. So, we certainly are big advocates. Um, uh, this coming week, we're working on legislation to create a, a housing tax credit, a state housing tax credit that we think could help a whole lot of people. Um, some of the things we've done in Portland, I think, that are perhaps most closely relate to this particular issue, is we do have three housing first developments. We have Logan Place, we have Lawrence House, and we have Houston Commons. And in each of these three, we took the most 
chronically disadvantaged, um, long-term homeless folks uh, and provided them a house first. And it's, uh, at the same time, we provided 24-hour support where there were at least um, two employees in those particular buildings, 24 hours. Um, Preble Street provided that staffing, and we've had great results. Uh, the number of emergency call uh, encounters decreased by 80%. The number of emergency room visits decreased by 78%. The amount of money um, that we sort of saved um, is, is just incredible. Because uh, more importantly is we've discovered that once people do have a roof over their head, they do start to engage in some of those services that work. So we're huge um, uh, supporters and advocates um, of trying to provide housing, particularly that will help homeless persons. But we also acknowledge it's sometimes it's not just a house. You've got to have that level of support. You've got to have that level of supervision and guidance. And I will say, on occasion, um, particularly when we've opened the new Housing First developments, and somebody has lived on the streets with their friends for years and years, they leave um, for a day and they go hang out with their friends, perhaps in the parks. And it's a challenge to us. Um, we're fortunate that we can work with them and remind them that they do in fact have a home now. They um, have as many challenges in their lives and most of yet that they in fact have their own home. And so we need to coax them back into our homes and clearly, they, hopefully, they will start going to the parks less and less. The challenge that we then encounter is because they live with friends for years and years, not live, live on the streets with friends, some of those friends want to come stay in their apartment. And our lease is with one person, not with four or five. And so again, with the, the staff that are there, we're able to help that individual uh, sometimes have some difficult conversations friends. So uh, again, we're not um, really serving people that are homeless day to day. We hopefully can get them into their homes once and for all. We have about 300 formerly homeless people that live in our housing. Thank you very much for those uh, thoughtful, detailed answers. And clearly, there's a lot of layers to this, um, as I think the other questions will point out. Um, and question two really kind of circles back to some of those um, items that you've talked to so far, but um, is there anything that you want to circle back on in terms of to what extent are the strategies that you mentioned or if there's any strategies that you did not get to mention, to what extent are those working? Um, how could the current approaches perhaps work more effectively? And you know, where are the gaps? Um, and, I will pass the microphone over to whoever, if anyone kind of informal wants to just. Well, I don't stand formal or formal or whatever it is, but I've got a quick comment to make. Uh, I have several acquaintances who've had a very good experience with this quote unquote Portland Opportunity Crew. They enjoy the work it gives them and the lunch and whatever, and, and you know, it beats doing nothing. So that, that, I, I think that's a good program, and I'd like to see it expanded if at all possible. Does anyone else have anything to add? Because I think we kind of touched on it. Again, from a, from a statewide perspective, when we look at uh, main care expansion, uh, you know, we talk about the treatment of behavioral health issues, mental health issues, and substance use disorders, uh, and have, how that impacts our residents, um, some who happen to be homeless and suffer from homelessness. Uh, and I think, you know, again, the more we can get ahead of that uh, and the more uh, treatment we can provide, again, to our residents, our citizens throughout the state, uh, the, the better we'll be, we'll be in a much better position to address uh, issues just like this. And how it starts with those, those issues and it trickles itself down uh, into criminality in many cases uh, and other uh, problems that we deal with, uh, again, everywhere. From the perspective of substance use, I think one of a couple of things that um, Portland is doing really well is the home team has been wonderful. Um, 
milestone is a great resource when people are under the influence and they need a safe place to be and I think even more importantly the opportunity to connect to um, more services, more support and maybe beginning to find a pathway um, forward and the housing first model is wonderful and I think the biggest issue is really just not enough of these resources um, and the work piece. Um, the sense of purpose that people, all of us need, purpose and connection to others. So. Thank you. Anyone else want to touch on that question, Sarah? I know Dana certainly hinted at this, or more than hinted at this in his answer previously, but um, with his numbers of how many people they have housed and how many people have applied to them, uh, we are applied to them. We serve uh, on average 200 unduplicated individuals a night, and so that just uh, shows people how many people are seeking emergency shelter. Uh, so last year on average, I think the, the number that we served was 1,800 unduplicated individuals, so in the calendar year. Uh, so that just uh, speaks to the number of people that are homeless in the city of Portland. That's not obviously the number of people homeless in the parks, but um, that's the number of people that are seeking housing. Um, and not just in Portland in the state, but um, we definitely could use more affordable housing, always. I want to follow up a little bit on uh, what uh, Commissioner Sauschuk uh, mentioned. Um, we could do more and more housing first uh, developments. We think they work. Um, we think um, it's a good re recipe. However, there's one fundamental challenge, and that is how do we get the monies to pay for that support and, and to make sure that there are, in fact, staff present 24 hours a day. Uh, we don't want to fail, so we want that staff to be there. And so we are working uh, incredibly uh, closely with state officials to not just take advantage of that Medicaid expansion, but to very closely look at how can the Medicaid state plan um, be amended? What are the waivers that are available? Because we can find places to build housing um, we can get the money to build the housing, but the hardest thing is to provide the money to pay for the support um, to provide the necessary guidance and supervision. And so I think that's uh, uh, an avenue that's opening up now more than ever, and uh, we're very encouraged at this point. Thank you. Um, may I ask a qualifying question, Sarah? I mean, like, so un unduplicated, non-duplicated, does that mean their first time? Um, so when it comes to, uh, the next question is a little bit more about parks, and so what are some of the unique ways that our homeless neighbors currently use parks um, that you're aware of, and what are the services or opportunities that they find in the parks that are most important to persons that are in these circumstances? One of the things that struck me about this question, because I gave it a lot of thought, um, if you are someone that stays in the shelter, you are someone that is sleeping in a room next to, as Jim said, 75 strangers on a mattress six inches away, um, you know, that's a space where you don't get any privacy. So where someone who's housed may go to the park to seek enjoyment with others, for me, the thing that I thought of with this question was that if you are a homeless individual, you may go to the park for privacy or quiet enjoyment. So, that's... Can I cap what you're saying? Absolutely, Jim. I mean, I feel like making a speech here. I mean, it's very interesting. I mean, I'm not complaining about the physical situation of the Oxford Street shelter, but it is a reality that it's a huge room with all these mats on the floor and everybody sleeps next to each other. And if you eat at our street resource center soup kitchen, which I think they do a great job because I'm there all the time and I eat there, you know, I don't have to, but I eat there because I'm there working. But, you know, that's a very crowded place. 
I know people that eat lunch at Amistad that say they'd rather eat in a, in a, in a mellow environment at Amistad than be on a grocery in the zoo, as they call it. So, you know, all these people, you know, who falls to their own, no fault their own, whatever, are in this chaotic environment. And having a wide open space is very attractive, in my opinion. I can see, I can see lots of good reasons want to go to a park. And, but I do emphasize that whoever you are, there are certain behaviors that are expected of every civilized person, whether homeless or not. And I'll, I'll, I don't mind saying that. Uh, I just reiterate what everyone has said, I think. Um, quiet nature, being part of the community, um, like all of us watching the world go by, um, not being somewhere isolated and, you know, separated. Um, but also something that we hear very often at PRCC for people trying to recover is I can't go down to the Purple Street area because I will use. And that means I've got to sleep in the park, I've got to, you know, I'll, I'll do anything, but I can't go down there, it's not safe for me. And that's not a criticism of, you know, anyone, it's the reality. And if you're trying to avoid people, places, and things, and turn, you know, a new way of living without drugs or alcohol, that's not a safe place to be. Um, the park feels much safer. Thank you. Um, so question, the next question, uh, number four, is for our like friends groups that are here and groups that are involved with parks, what are the resources, tools, uh, best practices, and available uh, to parks groups and others who want to help deal with these situations and uh, get people involved who are experiencing, get involved with people who are experiencing homelessness um, in a way that's a safe approach. Who wants to go first? I'm all um, <clears throat> I clearly can't answer this, this question, but just hearing the dialogue and the, the presentation um, beforehand of, of what city officials are doing certainly seem to be um, on the right track for me. So I think. Um, dealing with uh, the behavior and not the individual, um, all of the things that were stated here um, were just particularly on the money. So it's really going to be hard for any of us to add a whole lot um, to this. I think the city has got a very responsible and respectful approach to it uh, now. I, I would just echo that um, the talking points that were given at the beginning of this that Sally had uh, included were, I thought, um, really headed in, in the right direction, if not right on. And so I think uh, events like this um, are also headed in absolutely the right direction if we're wanting to educate ourselves um, more events like this so that we can be talking about this, the uh, homelessness situation in our city so that we can be talking about the solutions, so that we can be having dialogues with one another. I think that is what we need to be doing. Um. Yeah, I think, uh, you know, a common question is, so what can I do about in a long list of, uh, of societal ills uh, that I've heard over the years? And one consistent answer that I've given is, is that we focus on cheap and easy. It's educating yourself having an opinion about what's happening, and then having your opinion be known by others. Uh, no matter what, what side of the issue you come down on, uh, educate yourself. To, to be here tonight, uh, it's not raining out, so it's probably the first night in the last year that it has. If you took time out of your life, your busy schedules, to be here to learn and to hear what's going on. And to me, that's halfway home. I didn't take a million dollars of this or a million dollars of that. It's educating yourself on what's happening here in our backyard, uh, keeping your, your hearts and your minds open. Uh, and then if you have an opinion on that, make that opinion be known with whoever it may be appropriate. Maybe the Parks Commission or, or City Department or the, the State of Maine, uh, whoever is appropriate based on uh, the issue at hand. So I think that's always important. 
I was um, really struck earlier with um, some of the comments about, or um, presentation about the lengths that cities have gone to, like to get to the point of like cutting down trees or removing benches. And I was thinking, I'm a social worker by training, I'm also a person in long-term recovery, but as a social worker, I've always, you know, been really interested and learned about systems and family systems, but then also the macro level of systems. And what struck me about that coming from the lens of addiction is thinking about, and anyone who has ever had a family member or someone, um, you know, in the throes of active addiction knows that the people around them can start getting kind of insane themselves in the ways of trying to manage and control and fix to the point of doing things that sort of are to our own detriment. So if you take that to a macro level and start, we start cutting down trees and taking out benches um, in an effort to um, control the situation and make it more manageable, um, so I was thinking about this and jotting notes as you were talking about how, um, and again, I'm looking at through the ends of, lens of addiction, but how this kind of situation can evoke feelings of hopelessness, powerlessness, anger, frustration, fear, and how that's very contagious. Um, um, so, I don't have any solution here about this, but I was thinking if we took that and flipped it at a mac and took it to a macro level, so what are the things we learn to do around how to interact with someone in active addiction, how to manage our own feelings, how to do, um, how to be loving and um, helpful and useful as opposed to um, cutting down trees and removing benches and then take that to the bigger system level. So I don't know what that would look like, but I, as I sit here, I think that's part of the community conversation about this, is what would that look like, and how would that impact, and um, be maybe a model. Yeah, let's see. Um, I got a list here that almost was just as used in our presentation to the business community that is probably similar to this list here that was up on the table up there that lists all the services available and everything. And of particular interest to the business community was the list of public restrooms because that's the situation with the business community. People, non-customers walk in and want to use their restroom. And at the end of the statement that I read, I said, I, I would like to say that we realize it's not always in your purview to offer someone a physical service but at least with this information, you can recognize a person's needs as a human being and offer them some alternative op options. So, I mean, you know, I can't think of a good place to go camping, that's for sure, but, but I mean, as far as restrooms are concerned, where public restrooms are, like City Hall and the library and, and various places where people, anybody can use the facilities, you know, it's, it's, it's always a good idea to try to find a positive channel, cha channel rather than starting a fight with somebody, you know, if, if that's at all possible. And I really, I've been out with the home team a couple times, walking with them to their visits and, and, and stuff and on the railroad tracks and everything else. And, and I always thought they did a great job, so I, I like them, you know. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I think in that category, what I'm hearing, and I think the point was made, and I was struck by um, what the ranger said and what the chief said that now you're addressing a human, not a problem. Um, that really resonated with me. Um, and, and addressing a, a, a behavior and not a person. Now, and drinking on a blanket in the park is illegal, whether you are going home somewhere at the end of the night or not. Um, it's an interesting perspectives. Um, so in the realm of solutions, uh, and I know we've covered a lot of ground here, um, are there other solutions that you're aware of, I mean, I City, um, Sally gave some great statistics on what's going on in other cities, but um, what other cities are doing to avoid conflicts and ensure that needs of all the park users are being met? Sure. 
Sure, so again, if I, if I talk about system-wide issues, uh, what I see as best practices around the country focus on uh, trauma, focus on adverse childhood experiences, focus on all these things that will come out sideways later in life. Uh, and uh, this conversation uh, should have some short-term approaches, some medium-term approaches, and some long-term approaches. And, and that happens to fall more into that long-term realm. Uh, other things, when I go back to the behavioral health side of the house, uh, I see nationally diversion centers, uh, places where you know somebody can't uh, quite be stabilized on their own couch or on the street corner, but they don't belong in jail. They don't belong in the ER. Uh, and if at all possible, we divert uh, folks out of the homeless uh, centers and for a more of a long-term approach to that. Um, and those are drop-off centers, diversion centers, warming centers. There's a bunch of different terms for those. Uh, and they're not cheap, uh, but there are federal-style programs that uh, are, are working with that. And I hear about those style programs uh, when we talk to other best practices around the country. Uh, other learning sites like the city of Portland is uh, for the way they deal with people in, in the midst of a crisis. Um, think, thinking of solutions, I, I had the good fortune um, four or five years ago to go to Cuba along with a few other housing uh, professionals from around the country. And it, it was fascinating um, to see how that country deals with um, uh, their housing challenges. But what I remember the most is how the parks are used. And we were riding in this bus from city to city, and it really didn't matter whether it was a huge city like Havana or a very small um, town of 500 people or so. In each city or community, there was always a park. There was a church around it, and then the community was built from there up. And every park seemed to be packed with people. And, and we were just kind of quite taken by what on earth are everybody's coming out to the parks. And, and what we learned is each park in each of those communities was the one spot in the entire community that had Wi Fi. And when we looked more, <laughs> we looked more closely, they, people weren't talking to one another, they were all on their, their, their phones. Um, and so I, I always remember that. But there's a little thought in there that I think the more we can make parks to be something of activity, I think of some of the movies in Congress Square um, Park that are going on, and whenever there's music in parks that bring people together. We certainly like the, uh, the peace and quiet of the parks, but I think also there's a huge opportunity to to bring some levels of entertainment and engagement in, uh, in our parks, um, but again, whether it's art or music or Wi-Fi or what have you, um, I think uh, it, it really is a, a very helpful approach to a city. Yeah, I gotta make a quick comment. I mean, I don't know if there's something the parks do, but there's something people get involved with. I mean, you know, I got my first apartment Portland in the early 70s, my rent was $103 a month. I have a similar one room apartment today, and my rent is $1,025 a month. So affordable housing, is, the lack of, is one of the major causes of homelessness. And I like what Investor Community Housing in Maine and other organizations are doing. I'm a joiner. One, one group I've joined is a fledging group called the Greater Portland Community Land Trust, whose mission is to acquire land in a trust form to, to to make affordable housing. If there's anything anybody can think of to promote the idea of affordable housing overall in any way, form, or, or means, which certainly could use of anybody's time. And I don't know if that makes any sense, but I had to say that. Yeah. Rents have gone up. Just <laughs> about. Um, so at this time, we've got a couple of questions. People had a chance to write down some questions on uh, index cards. And I'd like to uh, address these questions to our panelists and kind of narrow down timing a little bit and give you about a minute or so to respond to these. So um, the first one is, funding is an obvious problem. What ideas do you have about funding a housing first with social services model that is sustainable as opposed to building one big shelter that no neighborhood wants? Uh, and the person would like Dana or uh, Commissioner Sasha to speak to this. 
finance side. <laughs> I'm the commissioner of the state of Maine. I feel a little strange answering on behalf of the city of Portland, uh, for sure. Um, I, I can go back to a uh, task force uh, that I think, Dory, you were one of the chairs of a, a few years ago, and I think, uh, Commissioner, you and I were both, both on that. And at that particular time, I think we said we needed um, five more housing for us developments, and uh, um, we've done one. And, and so we do not have a sustainable way to, to develop the ones that we have been developing. I do think it's going to take um, a new resource that will pay for those support funds, like I mentioned earlier, um, that probably can be achieved through a Medicaid uh, waiver so that you can have that staff um, certainly there's a lot of um, uh, discussion about should they all be in Portland, probably not. Um, there is one key piece to making all of these succeed, somebody's got to pay the rent. And so while we build them, each time we need 30 um, project-based housing Section 8 vouchers from Portland Housing Authority. And that's not an endless supply either. So when we go to Westbrook or South Portland or, or some of the towns that don't even have housing authorities, we, we need to make sure that we can get those housing vouchers, we need to make sure we get the support money, we need to make sure we get the money to build it, we need to make sure we can find a site to do it. So it's four challenges. Um, I'm encouraged right now that there are, I think, three or four pieces of legislation that will provide um, some ongoing monies to, to provide the support to do these. So I'm encouraged that we can do more. Um, but I really don't think there's enough money, frankly, coming out of Washington because we're fighting to hold on to the vouchers we have and, and things like that. You know, one thing that I see uh, when I talk to treatment providers and, and work with uh, collaboratives around the state is that to this day, in 2019, we're far better now uh, with the opioid crisis than we were several years ago with a long ways to go. Uh, that I still see a lot of these collaborative groups that don't have housing as a component. Uh, there's a lot of, there's, there's peers, there's super people all the way around, but there's a chunk that misses, uh, misses the boat, and that is a, a lack of housing. When I think about work with the Greater Portland Addiction Collaborative, uh, which Leslie is a huge piece of, one thing that I thought was great about that from day one was there was a housing component to that. It's truly collaborative, truly comprehensive wraparound services that you don't do all these things and then fall off a cliff as you go back to the same house with the same phone number with the same friends, the same address, and people know where to find you. Uh, it gets you plugged in, and uh, it's, it's simple facts that if you've got some place to lay your head at night, everything else will in fact be easier for you. It won't be easy, but easier for you uh, to seek treatment and to have some kind of consistency in your world uh, so you can be stable enough uh, to get better. And uh, I think that's a big piece of the, of the puzzle. As pointed out, there's just a suggestion that Dana or Commissioner Flashdark um, speaks about. Does anyone else have anything to add? Um, so the other question uh, from the audience was, can you explain who is on the home team? How do they work? And should people call them before the police? <laughs> I, I answer that one as a former board member of Milestone uh, Recovery Act, Milestone Foundation, and that's home teams based out of Milestone. Uh, top notch people, uh, incredible program, uh, life saving, a truly life saving, uh, and uh, it's home. It's it's homeless outreach and engagement. Uh, so uh, these are folks that are literally in a van and they are proactive. Uh, so they're out, uh, they know every location in town, uh, and they're out driving those locations, getting out, walking in those alleys, checking out those tree lines, working with people. The other aspect of that is that people can, in fact, call the home team directly in their dispatch center, and they'll send somebody out uh, to deal uh, with whatever situation it is. And when I say deal, it's like they come out, and they're talking to people, they're getting people plugged into services. Uh, it, it, I am biased as all day, and I'll admit it. Milestone is an incredible organization at a bunch of different levels, uh, and the home team is just one aspect of that. 
but something that uh, used to have a sun, sundown band years ago. Uh, we fought for 10 years to get something like the home team back. Uh, and it seems like every year uh, they continue to struggle for funding to survive. Uh, we'd love to expand it out, you know, 24-7. They are just uh, top-notch people that are out there. And I can't read it enough saving lives. Uh, that's the number one priority. And uh, if you wanted to break it down to brass tacks, uh, they also save a lot of money when you're not run, running an ambulance to go pick somebody up that needs a ride in a van to get someplace for the night. Um, so if you needed to go to that end, uh, which uh, in some cases the political realm needs to, to hear that, um, but I think it's it's uh, such an impactful uh, program. It always has been. Yeah, I just want to quickly say that uh, Homeless Voice of Justice does most of our work here in Portland. But we have the ambition of having other chapters in other areas of the state. It looks like we're going to have a chapter related to the benefit peer support center that just opened. We also visit Link Center in Augusta and in the soup kitchen and places in Lewiston and Brunswick. And, and I mean, all these towns are different, have different range of services, but relatively speaking, it seems to me that Portland exceeds all the other towns in the state as far as making services available to people. That's my impression, anyhow. I don't know if right about this. <laughs> Any other thoughts on that question? Okay. Thank you. I think to some extent this probably um, in some ways brings up more questions in terms of how like, people can team together. Um, at this point, we wanted to uh, take a few moments, and if there's any questions from the audience that have not already been asked or brought up, um, any burning questions or issues, I will do my best. I can't speak. I'll come around with the mic, it's not that big a room. Thank you, I wanted to pick up uh, where you left off, Mike. Um, definitely thinking, um, it only takes one bad experience um, for a resident, a business, a neighborhood to really be turned off on these kinds of services. You were talking about the wonderful work that these groups do, but we don't hear enough about that. We don't hear the success stories anywhere near as much. The news is splattered with all this negativity and how things aren't working or won't work. How can we do a better job of getting the positive stories out, the success stories out there, to prove that maybe maybe that can help one business decide to be supportive or more supportive, or one neighborhood to be more willing to accept a shelter of some sort or a home of some sort? How can we do that? How can we, can we work to get that, that information out, that news out of the yeah, So I, I would agree completely. I mean, uh, what we get caught up in time is you see statistics and you see this and you see that. Uh, to me, the, the thing that truly uh, makes a difference are those human stories. And uh, Leslie can speak about this for days, but friends that, that I have now that are in long-term recovery, uh, I hear their stories, or I sit on panels just like this, and I don't need to be there. I can just stare at them and, and see the strength that they have uh, and hear about their journey. And to me, that, that shows that recovery happens. And it's easy in society to see stats or see a story and whatever and go, recovery doesn't happen. I've never been, I've never experienced that. So you can just write off a whole group of people uh, that that are human beings just like us, loved ones and family members just like us. And so it's easy for, for folks to go, well, we, we can't solve that. There's no way we can get to it. But in fact, we are surrounded by recovery uh, every single day. Uh, and I think it's very similar uh, with people that suffer from homelessness. There are people that are striving every day, fighting incredibly hard, doing everything humanly possible. Uh, they don't want to be homeless. Nobody wants to be homeless. That's a fact. And so those stories are out there, and I don't think they're hard to find. I do think at times it's hard to get those on the six o'clock news. That's not as racy as something else. Um, and I know, as an example, to bump back a milestone recovery, they would do a, a monthly story on somebody. And those are the stories that I want to see. I want to see the human aspect of things. Statistics, all that stuff, I get it. That's my world as much as it anybody else's. Uh, so that's an important piece of what we do. Uh, but we can't forget about the individuals. And you should put those good stories, those good backgrounds, in the bank for days when they may not be uh, as sunny and something's going on. 
Um, and I know there's a lot of incredible stories. When you go to these Housing First locations and you talk to people, um, or in, in, in a past life, talking to Homeless Voices for Justice, for people that I have arrested multiple times, uh, legit, right? Everybody knows everybody by name, and have just come light years with just enough help. Uh, that's what they needed. Not a hand out, but a hand up. Uh, and that stuff is legit. It's, it's real, and it's everywhere around us. So I, it's a great question, though, because that's something that we just need. We can, we, we can impact that, right? Are we volunteering? Are we going out to make contact with these groups? Because they're begging for assistance. They're begging for help. Uh, whether it's at uh, the polling booth or uh, in the bank account or somebody that can show up for a couple hours or drop off a sweater. Uh, any help across any, any, uh, any length of this conversation is incredibly helpful. So I appreciate the question. Thank you. Any other questions? Thanks, Diane. I want to thank all of you. You just do incredible work. Um, uh, my question is, I really love the idea of Wi-Fi in the parks, and we work really hard to bring events into our neighborhood park because we have a strong commitment that socialization is what really helps people feel connected. And one of the things I'm thinking about is, do you see any model um, programs in the country where people use the public parks for uh, camping, like a night under the stars. And one of the things that happened, that's been happening, I've lived in my neighborhood for 30 years now, and we're starting to really see a change. Um, many more sober living homes are coming into the neighborhood, uh, recovery centers, uh, just this is a real change in the, in the whole, we have many more different types of people and we've, I've spent some time talking to homeless people sleeping in our Longfellow Park. It's a very nice, quiet, dark park, and people feel safe sleeping in there. But do you ever see any program around the country where people open up their parks for people to sleep for and get to know the neighbors? I mean, it's, it was interesting because some of the neighbors came out and helped and provided food and bedding, and then other people called the police. So it was like a real range of reactions to people sleeping in our park. I, I just wonder what your thoughts are on that. You know, I, I will tell you that uh, Sally's team uh, brought pianos to parks downtown, right? And uh, Sally will tell you that in a department head meeting, she mentions pianos. And a cop by, uh, by training and experience, I'm picturing a piano on fire going down High Street at a thousand miles an hour. I'm like, Sally, what are you killing me over here? What are you doing? This is, this is madness. Who would put pianos in a park? And it was an incredible, incredible idea that worked incredibly well. Um, sure, it wasn't 100%, but it was very impressive to me. It was way outside the box. Um, and, I thought, <laughs> and I thought, and I thought that was pretty cool. And uh, I'm gonna, I'm gonna own it as my idea and move to Augusta. So don't, don't tell me about that. <laughs> so I mean, there's things like that. Everything is in play, uh, and these are beautiful green spaces that need to be used as much as humanly possible because they're beautiful and they're for everybody. Uh, so I'm not sure that anything's outside the box as far as a, you know, a sleep in or whatever. I don't know what the logistics uh, of that would look like. Um, but I do think that all things are open, you know, and I, I think we just need to, to, to go into it, looking at these locations as an incredible resource for everyone to share and then figure out how to get to yes, uh, rather than automatically saying pianos are insane. What's the matter? So, um, I'm not sure. I, I know I didn't answer your question uh, directly, but that's where I'm coming from. I got a comment to make on that. Uh, I'm not sure if this answers anybody's question, but uh, several years ago, when I was living in Biddeford at the time, they had the Occupy movement, or whatever you want to call it, in Lincoln Park. It was, had this big campsite all over the place, and some friends of mine were there, so I visited them. I wasn't. I didn't stay there, and and. It was problematic in a number of respects. And for one thing, it was funny because, um, not funny, but a lot of individuals I was familiar with who were milestone regulars, they used to come to Lincoln Park to crash for the day 
and having all these occupied people in their spot, or the quote unquote their spot, was a born contention. And eventually, the police had to ask everybody to leave because it, it looked like they were going to be there forever for a while. I, and at the time, I was saying, I, I, I hope you guys have having fun sleeping out in the snow. I'm glad I'm going back home to visit. I don't know if that answers any questions, but that's my observation on all that. So, whatever you're doing, good luck. Do you want to share your comment about the pianos? I whispered to Diane that we had some of our homeless friends uh, playing the pianos and busking with um, tip jars. <laughs> Earning a living. Resourceful. <laughs> Anne? Well, I'm glad you brought up the issue of the uh, video. Oh, there is. The Occupy thing, because uh, I would uh, challenge Mike, who I have great fondness for and respect, but not everything's on the table. And I don't think camping in the parks is on the table because it would turn in all the parks into camping sites, I think. I just think we can't go there. I can't camp in the park. Yeah, I'm more than happy to respond to that. Okay. Yeah, I'm, yeah. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, Gordon. <laughs> yeah, what, what I heard Carol talking about was like a one night, yes. you're looking at the stars and you're Good doing something time. like that. Uh, I, me and Vern worked Occupy in, in Lincoln. We did the whole thing from soup to nuts. So I let Vern speak to camping in the parks, but I don't think that's happening anytime yeah. soon. I, I do think if it's an opportunity, and there's you know some folks out there, and somebody's giving a, a class on constellations or whatever that would be, there's an opportunity to do something after dark that maybe uh, a park's not currently used that way. So again, you're expanding. It wouldn't be Wi-Fi, so it wouldn't be nearly as popular. <laughs> but uh, maybe there's an opportunity, to, again, to get like, outside the box and are we using our parks so they're as friendly and uh, as welcoming as humanly possible. So, uh, in case there's any question, I'm not uh, advocating for camping in, uh, in the parks, but I thank you for clarifying that. Any other questions? That is really uh, informative, and thank you all for coming and uh, taking so much time to answer all of those questions. Um, I'm not going to touch on all of it, but uh, I did have, uh, I was thinking a little bit about parks and sort of within one circle or step of parks and what we can focus on. Um, uh, certainly the housing piece is, is another level, uh, um, but um, so as, as I was Hearing all of your thoughts, I was thinking, you know, is this a, is there, do we need more people? Do we need more physical, ask, like, sort of investments? Um, and, and, and so sort of to that end, I was wondering, um, like, I heard about bathrooms, I heard about the need for more just space, like open space, like the idea of creating places um, for people to have a respite. Um, I was thinking um, sort of about home team, or you know, do we need more people for that, or do we need more vans and equipment, or do we need both? And it's probably an all of the above. Um, but if in the world of sort of resources, you know, there's there's things that we can do to get together and talk, and those are within existing resources. We have a green space gathering. We have a theme each year. We can probably think about more workshops or opportunities to connect people. But there's also this, what are we going to do with the limited financial resources that we have? And should we be focusing on, you know, more human resources or more equipment and physical um, investments in our parks? Um, so just if folks could have any thoughts about that, um, thank you. I think those are all good questions. There were a lot of layers there, but um, I, I mean, I think there are always uh, a need for, for more focus on this. There's always a need for more focus on this issue, whether it, um, you know, be and, and park related, keeping it park related. Um, I think that uh, you know we absolutely we've named a you know a lot of community resources up here and I think I'll, I won't speak for those partners I won't say where their resources are 
Um, but I think that the fact that uh, we have interested parties here tonight who are willing to, to pay attention to this issue and educate themselves on this issue, I think that alone is a really fantastic start. So I think the fact that we can, you know, I said it earlier, be having conversations on this and people can walk away tonight even feeling a little bit more educated about what they could do if they encounter somebody in the park who is experiencing homelessness or feel a little bit more like they might understand something that that person is going through. That to me feels like a win. And if we can continue to have those conversations so that people might know what resource to offer that person or you know, even just engage them in a conversation, I think that's you know, definitely a step in the right direction. But I would absolutely welcome those conversations. So. Um, I just want to take a moment and, and the question um, triggers the, this a notion, but what we are building for, for housing these days, largely because of the cost and the cost limits, is we're building a lot of really small, small apartments. And so uh, Thomas Heights on, on Washington Avenue are 340 square foot apartments, Oak Street Lofts, um, which is, you know, just crammed into Oak Street. A lovely building, a lovely, again, 350 square foot uh, apartments. So if you have a picture living there, um, many of our residents need parks more than ever because we are really infilling our city to a great degree. We are building very small uh, units and, and certainly people live with, with very few belongings. But I think there's a kind of a natural link here between sort of shrinking the living space of people and the corresponding demand on parks. The degree with which, say, 10 or 15 percent of our, our residents are, are homeless, we're kind of helping people that were homeless and getting apartments, but they're still going to want to go back to the parks. And so I think there's just a, a fascinating connection here between <laughs> So that particularly when you think about the future of housing, where, where living spaces are just getting smaller and smaller and smaller, and the effect that has on, on parks. And I, I think it's just a policy question that we got to um, take a good look at. Here. Okay. Okay. So we have time for one more question. Question for Commissioner Sussman. Uh, having moved from being the thick of events in Portland to, to Augusta. Uh, do you see prospects, improved prospects for getting more resources from the state to, to deal with some of the needs we've been talking about? There are a number of our homeless are from elsewhere in the, elsewhere in the state, and many people, I think, feel that it would be appropriate to, to seek more state resources to address these needs that we've been talking about. So Governor Mills gave me a check to provide you tonight. <laughs> Councilor Bassett was here earlier. I was going to present that a little later. Uh, but uh, I do think that as a state, we have seen uh, a push in this first uh, probably 120 some odd days. Whether again, I think uh, in this morning's meeting, Commissioner Lambro from DHHS talked about 19,000 plus people that have access uh, to uh, treatment and Medicaid uh, expansion. Uh, now that we didn't have just a few months ago, uh, whether it's the schools uh, and more money coming back uh, to communities uh, and 2,800 legislative bills that are working their way through the system uh, with a lot of those things in mind um, to try to provide um, more coverage for that societal uh, fiber that uh, I think has been missing uh, in recent years. So I do think uh, that we're in a better spot uh, now than we have been. Um, the answer to questions like, like some of these that have been asked tonight, it's always going to be more. What, what do we need more? We need more. Uh, because when you're in the desert, you need more of everything across the board. Um, so we're not there yet. Uh, I don't think anybody would say that. Uh, but I do think we're, we're heading in the right direction. And from my perspective, we're heading in the right direction uh, in a collaborative approach. It's not just somebody that's cutting checks and throwing them around. Uh, I continue to see a lot of great partnerships. Uh, now around the state um, and uh, conversations that, that I have every day 
are with good people that want to do good things. And uh, that's what my mindset and my experiences from, from Portland, uh, seeing that these are, these are folks that, that get it, uh, that want to make a difference, and are in fact making a difference. So yes, I do think, uh, I think we already have more resources than we had, and I think there's more to come. Um, I think it's, uh, um, to add on to what you said, um, Commissioner, um, it's a really exciting time in a way because um, we are seeing already resources come to um, the recovery community centers to train and um, deploy and support recovery coaches. Um, there's a, a bill that's moving along for um, recovery residences and you know sober houses and housing is a huge part of this. It's the number one thing that people say they need when they come into the PRCC is housing and um, a place to live. And part of that for a lot of people's recovery is um, safe recovery housing, um, sober housing. So there's um, both resources coming, um, I think, um, pretty much promised out of the administration to expand the number of um, recovery residences, but also certification process to make sure that those are safe and quality housing, because it's kind of wild west out there right now with people saying, you know, I'm a sober house. Um, and um, so I think there's a lot of really good good resources coming, and um, I'll be, I'll just say, it was a really long eight years, um, those of us working on the ground, and to just have the energy of the people that are in place now, um, the work that's getting done and has been stuck and moving, and then just sometimes these, what may seem like a little bit of money, but we can stretch, we learned how to stretch a little bit of money a long way. And so, um, it's, and with the opioid epidemic, it's, um, I think one of the silver, if there is any silver lining, it's the attention that has been brought to addiction, not just to opioids, but the whole issue of addiction and the stories, the positive stories that recovery is possible. And we need so many more of those. Um, what you said, like the blessing of my job, and when I think about, like I know recovery works, I know these things work because it worked for me, but it's not really just because it worked for me, it's because I've had the blessing of see, witnessing it work for thousands of people and getting those stories out and sharing and if anyone wants someone to come tell stories of recovery and hope call me we have hundreds of people that will come and share their story and help spread that message when we talk about recovery it, it, it makes a light beam in my head so i have to make a couple of comments i mean i appreciate being in recovery i appreciate the support i've received from from various providers one of the reasons that I'm a strong advocate of the housing first model is because I've been in a lot of situations, various treatment centers, where I made a mistake and picked up a drink, and as soon as you do that in a place like that, you're thrown out the door very quickly. And I was grateful enough to, with the help, with the help I got to be able to survive myself so far, but I know other people who do not survive that experience, and that's why I'm a strong advocate of the housing first model. And it's funny, I run into people every day that I've met in various stages of recovery, who are back having a hard time again. And I always, I say, you know, if I can do it, anybody can. So, you know, don't give up the ship, ship because it is possible to, to be sober and enjoy life. Thank you. Um, thank you so much for having us here. and um, very eye-opening and insightful and uh, educational. And I'm going to ask Della to come up now. Turn the mic over. I just want to say thank you so much for all of the information that you shared and for all of the work that you do. 
Um, in Congress Square Park, we are working on ways that we could train volunteers more effectively so that we could be rad radically hospitable to every single person who comes in. And so just hearing you has, um, it's really been moving. Thank you. Um, and, and, and I wanted to uh, extend an invitation to all of you. We have trainings that will be uh, starting in May and June for our volunteers. Uh, things like overdose treatment uh, and things like verbal judo, situational awareness, uh, and also um, how to befriend every person who comes into your space. Um, so we also have groups that are forming in Portland to share information with one another about, uh, it's like a collaborative working group. How are we uh, implementing um, hospi uh, hospitality within our space? Um, how is activation working? Um, what conversations have been successful? Who have we been speaking to? And what's up in their lives? And how can we be the most helpful from a relationship perspective? And so um, I'll extend invitations, I extend invitations to all of those uh, trainings and conversations to all of you. I'd love to have a collaborative working group on this uh, and understand more fully how we as parks uh, play a, such a vital role in meaningfulness in people's lives. Um, I think speaking about recovery, it's so incredibly important to us to be a sober space and have entertainment. You know, Portland is full of like beer pubs and all of these places that, of course, we have to spend uh, so much money to access. And also, um, a lot of those spaces are unsafe for people who are in recovery. And so parks are in that unique space of being um, uh, these special places that are available to all people. Um, so I will send information through the Parks Commission and also through the Green Spaces Coalition if you'd like to join in those conversations. Thank you. Um, just one a few quick thank yous um, to the city manager for having Portland Media Center here. They recorded the session for us, which is fantastic. And to Grove School, and again, just the department, appreciate you and all of your time. Thank you very much.